Okay, members, can I um, start the meeting? We have a quorum. Uh, and can I begin by welcoming members to the Palace Stables in Armagh and thank personally uh, Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council for kindly hosting today's meeting. Uh, I was just commenting uh, before the meeting that I think it is great as a committee to, to get out, uh, to go to the likes of a council area where we can get a synopsis driving through uh, the infrastructure issues pertaining to a particular area, but it's also very, very interesting uh, to be in such a beautiful uh, setting as well. And I think members can, uh, can have their own points to share in that. So thanks very much to Chief Executive Roger Wilson, who I know we'll be hearing from later, for uh, kindly accepting um, our, 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 our request to meet here today. So, members, could I advise of the need to maintain social distancing during the meeting and provide a brief overview of the day's business? The committee today will consider a briefing from Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council, reference the reinstatement of Portadown to Armagh Railway Line and also wider infrastructure issues pertaining to the area. We will also hear a briefing from the Portadown Armagh Railway Society, uh, um, which will, will follow after the briefing from ABC. Uh, agenda item number one, which is apologies. Uh, I have three apologies, Patrick DeLarge, uh, David Hillage and George Robinson. I think, apart from that, everybody else is present. So we will move on to agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business. Um, I, again, as has previously done, I thank the Council for facilitating today's meeting. And can I also advise members that the engagement event agreed by the Committee will take place at 2 p.m. next Wednesday, the 15th of December. Information uh, will issue to the Committee this week. The event is online and will end at 3.30. Six members are required to attend to facilitate the event, so I would ask members to please make their best endeavours to do so. Uh, each member will engage with one of the organisations for 30 uh, minutes regarding their area of concern and then report back to the committee and summarise the concerns and propose how the committee could address each issue. Members are broadly aware of the groups that will be attending. There are groups that have actually requested a meeting with the committee during COVID, but unfortunately have not been able to do so. And given time restraints for the committee for the rest of the mandate, we thought it best to organise such an event. So if members, when uh, receiving an email uh, from the clerk and others in relation to that, could, re could reply positively, it would be much appreciated. Uh, members have no further questions in relation to that event? Okay. Agenda item number three, which is draft minutes. Could I turn members' attention to page six, draft minutes of the meeting on the 1st of December 2021? Are members content uh, with the minutes and are they a true and accurate reflection of the meeting? Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members, matters arising from the meeting. Can I turn members' attention to page 17 of your meeting pack, which are matters arising from the meeting on the 1st of December 2021? Can I ask members if they have any issues arising from the meeting? I see no hands raised. Uh, can I draw your attention to page 22 of your meeting pack, which is a standing committee request for information? Uh, and I, can I advise members that uh, further to the committee's agreement to a motion in the chamber regarding DVA testing, after consideration by members over the past week, the clerk has provided a, a memo at page 38 of your meeting packs uh, regarding a proposed motion. The proposed motion would be, if members agree, that this assembly recognises both the difficulties and disruptions uh, caused to all public-facing services, including DVA, as a result of the global COVID-19 pandemic as well as unnecessary costs that can, that can be faced by individuals and businesses as a result of preventable uh, delays in the, in the provision of driver and vehicle testing services by DVA, particularly in relation to driver testing and retesting, uh, and the reduced number of vehicles being tested compared to pre-pandemic levels, acknowledges the work done by the Minister for Infrastructure and the Department to date to restore services, and calls for, on the Minister for Infrastructure to put in place creative and innovative measures to eliminate unnecessary and preventable delays in order to reduce costs and uncertainty to individuals and businesses. Are members content with the agreed motion? Yeah. Uh, Cahill Boylan? Yeah, Chair, I'd be content with that. I mean, each member will have an opportunity in the Chamber then to express opinions or views at that point in time, but I am happy enough for the warden of that motion. Okay. Members broadly content? Agreed. Great. We will um, put that over now for the clerk to, to try to schedule in for uh, debate uh, as soon as possible. Okay, members. Agenda item number five, which is correspondence. And can I draw members' attention to the correspondence memo at page 42 of your meeting pack? Members will see uh, a, a list uh, included 
uh, number f um, and, and suggested actions from 5.2 down until 5.17. Can I turn members' attention to page 72, which is a response from the Minister for Infrastructure to issues arising from the committee meeting on the 17th of November 2021. Uh, Liz Cummins. Sure, just on, on, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's just looking at no, quite not on this no, no, no. Okay, so members are, are happy enough to note at page 78 you will see in your packet request from Renewable NI to brief uh, the committee on its findings of powering a green recovery report. I, I think members, we have had a number of reports in our requests in relation to hydrogen and indeed other renewable sources. I think what would be useful is for us to wait until the publication of an energy strategy uh, and then perhaps arrange a day of. Uh, perhaps the committee focus would be on renewables and indeed energy. If members were content with that proposed action, we, we will look further down the line whenever that's best place to include. Members content with that action point? Content, sure. Okay. So members are content overall with the actions as suggested in the correspondence member memo. Okay, we will now move to agenda item number six, which is a briefing from our Mass City sure, Bam. Sorry, no, sorry, I don't want to come on page 340. Oh, sorry, sorry. Off the correspondence. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it was just in relation to the MOT fines um, that have, mm -hmm. you know, during the pandemic, because, it, yeah, because we'd, we'd, I'd raised this before, <coughs> where um, some people had got penalised for not having car tax, which they couldn't get because they couldn't get an MOT through no fault of their own. So, I mean, the PSNI letter there states that this enforcement is a function of DVLA, who we were under the impression had um, yeah. been engaging with the PSNI on this. So I think it would be good if we could write to the Minister and the DVLA to see what's being done to make sure, to even enable people to appeal yeah. where they've been penalised. I think that's a fair enough comment. I think that the police have been sort of relatively vague on, on what information they can. Maybe they've given yeah. us the, the information that they, they hold, uh, but certainly I would um, <coughs> happily proceed with um, um, a note to the Minister and the Department regarding um, the DVS perspective on this and the Department. So, yeah, and see if there's right. Right. Uh, Just to highlight, uh, uh, as well as this aspect of fines, there are other fines that are uh, we'll be unaware of in terms of our own yeah. local services, in terms of... Um, uh, SORN declarations. If, if members have, uh, sorry, members of the public who have been driving their car um, without MOT but been allowed to, but then uh, when their tax runs out, if they do, do not uh, submit a SORN, a SORN declaration and take their car off the road, when they go to retax, they will face a fine. Uh, so there are other hidden fines and difficulties caused to the public because of the uh, inordinate delays in being able to get an MOT test. Okay, point noted. Could I also draw a member's attention to page 116, which is the PSNI response to the committee's note in relation to tax on TransLink. I just think it would be notable for the, uh, for the committee to put on record its concern regarding in the 12-month period, the 1st of October 2020 to the 30th of September 2021, that a total of 200 offences were recorded by the police service to include nine offences of burglary, robbery and theft, and 191 offences of criminal damage. Uh, of the 191 criminal damage offences, 139 were classified as criminal damage to a vehicle. So I think that it would be important just for the committee to put on record its concerns surrounding that. Now, obviously, this is a much wider issue uh, that certainly um, we as a committee must do all we can to ensure safety of TransLink staff uh, who provide a vital uh, uh, public service function. Our members agreed that we could, we could maybe organise within our departmental briefing with the Minister to probe further on this issue regarding the tax on TransLink. Agreed, Chair. Agreed. Okay, members, we will now move. Uh, sorry, Chair, before you move yes. on, there is a uh, points, correspondence Chair. from. Sorry. Uh, no, go on ahead. Uh, finish that. Uh, uh, there's correspondence there from uh, Logistics UK. Yeah. Yes. Uh, where they're requesting some action from the committee. Okay. Uh, That's the point I was going to raise, Chair, yeah. at uh, page 68, Logistics UK. I mean, clearly with people coming in to present, but yeah. go forward that on to, to the department for a response. Yeah. I, I think that's a sensible suggestion, and I know we do have a briefing down the line yeah. with other representative sectors, and it was requested for Logistics UK and others to be included. Uh, so certainly I think that will be an opportune time for these concerns to be raised, but in the meantime we could certainly write to the Department uh, regarding some of these wider concerns. Uh, Roy Beck. Well, one particular concern that, that I noted from it um, was the current exemption uh, for uh, parcels 
uh, to where there's not a requirement for declarations to, made, to be made and the potential for 3,000 individual declarations uh, for a single container or six, is it 8,000 on a, on a, on a uh, cargo flight uh, you know that is adding huge costs it may not be restricting movement but it is adding huge costs and will be a burden to many suppliers who may decide again not to supply Northern Ireland customers yeah. No, I, th I think it's an important point to have raised. We have issues pertaining to the uh, correspondence in relation to HGV apprenticeships, de uh, delegated driving examiners, use of chief and, and peak uh, or uh, sailing capacity. So I think we could get a, a, a briefing from the department regarding the wider issues. Chair or Clerk, I want to bring you in on this point. That's fine. If, if Logistics UK are coming in as well, I can summarise those points in a, yeah. in a memo to the committee at the time. Yeah. Okay, Andrew? Yeah, just briefly, 5.6 is your response from the Minister and it references the, twen the review of the 2011 Planning Act. Mm -hmm. Chair, it's December now and there's still no outcome of this review of the Planning Act. I don't know what the Department's up to, but we need, they need to be able to come back to us yep. and tell us what the outcome of this is. And Originally, we were meant to have an outcome from this at, towards the summer and it's now winter. No, I don't. So uh, I just request we write to the department and ask when on earth is this review going to finish? Happy to support that recommendation. Uh, it was noted after the committee away day that yeah. one of the primary interests of the committee will be the review of the 2011 Planning Act. Uh, and this committee has an important role to play given the evidence that we've heard surrounding statutory consultees. Indeed, I think we may hear a bit later in relation to uh, planning difficulties here locally surrounding different council areas and massive infrastructure <coughs> projects. So I think uh, it would be prudent for the committee to write to the department to ask for some haste in relation to this matter. So I would yeah. support that if the committee were in agreement on that point. Great, Cal. Yeah, Chair, just another point on, on planning. Uh, I know that one of my colleagues raised it in the chamber this week in relation to DFA, who's a statutory consultee to the planning process. I mean, it's very, very slow. So can we right away to the department to see the stats in relation to that over the last couple of years of responses from, from DFA in particular? Because, I mean, the planning process is held up right across the board. Of course. But, I mean, we need, we need to identify what's going wrong. And, I mean, I appreciate what Andrew said about about the planning act in general, but we need to find out why the consultees are... are so slow in responding to it because it's holding up business. Holding I, th up. I think it would be obviously some of these statutory consultees actually are within the remit of the DFI, so I think it would be good where possible, and I think we could maybe do this across the board, is to try to find out what the average waiting time is for, for each representative statutory consultee in relation to planning, because I think that will give us a more holistic uh, picture. Yep. Uh, I think some of that information does already exist, so we can happily include that in uh, correspondence and indeed for further information for members. So I have went through most of this. Are members content uh, to note? Members will also... Sorry, Roy Beggs. It's 5.6. I'd just like to make a point there. <coughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, it's a, an email that came by uh, Paula Bradley, from a member of the public, uh, about uh, lack of availability of electric charging points. Uh, recently it's been highlighted to me that the Electrical Vehicle Association of Northern Ireland membership who have had been surveyed are overwhelmingly in favour of charging yeah. uh, of uh, electric uh, charge points because uh, in doing so they know that there will be a mechanism for maintaining them and incentive to keep them running at this moment in time it actually, uh, the companies that provide them will make more money <coughs> if they're not working because they'll not have to provide free electricity. Uh, <coughs> and uh, in particular, there's also uh, an issue where uh, I understand a vehicle that's actually sat for over 48 hours in an electric charge point, uh, actually blocking it for others using it. So if there's a charging mechanism, that can also ensure a turnover of those of those spaces so others can get their vehicles charged. So the question which I think we should be asking the, min the Minister at this moment in time, is there any legislative um, difficulties in any private organisation from introducing a charging mechanism? And if so, when will they be removed if there are any barriers to enabling uh, uh, such um, uh, change to occur so that Electric car drivers will have a much greater level of certainty that charge points will be working and an increased likelihood of them being available. Okay. 
Do members have any other points you want to add to that? Sure, just on that, and I appreciate we, we've challenges now with the, with the infrastructure that's now, but going forward we are very supportive of this, because I can see further challenges going ahead, especially if it's private sector. So we need to find out exactly what the department or what legislative process is going to be there in the future to address these matters, okay. besides what the challenge we face now. Any further comments? <coughs> members are content with that proposal from Roy <coughs> Beggs in relation to writing to the, the department? Great. Great. Members, I just want to draw your attention also to uh, 512 and 5.13, which was the reports uh, to the uh, Belfast City Council in relation to the Department for Infrastructure. Um, I suppose what of concern to me would be York Street Interchange is mentioned in both, but the variation in, in response in relation to that. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a huge public interest story, and I think what we c we should be doing as a committee uh, is trying to investigate further as to what have been the delays. Where does this stand now with the department, uh, alongside also which has been raised continuously the ASX, um, that we could hear more information in relation to these. Uh, would members be happy enough to for, on that 5.12 and 5.13 for further information in relation to that? Right. Yeah, I, I think we should do it, and. Um took six, seven minutes to get through the junction this morning and there's congestion there every morning uh, and that means those vehicles are sitting in traffic giving off Car. emissions to the immediate area, uh, adding pollution yeah. uh, than what otherwise would be in place as well as inconveniencing drivers and adding costs to industry. So I think we should be seeking an update uh, as to what is happening with this junction. Yes, because I, I think we noted last week in relation to the provide sort of indicative or indicative budgets that there was an increase in funding but again the language surrounding York Street interchange now has certainly given me cause for concern so if members are content we can uh, ask for an update on that and also a briefing session in relation to York Street interchange members content content thanks members okay so i've now covered correspondence unless any other members any point to raise Okay, we'll now move for the third time again to the briefing uh, from Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Council. Uh, I'll turn members' attention to page 345 of your pack. And can I welcome at this stage uh, Mr Roger Wilson, uh, Chief Executive of Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council, and Mrs Olga Murta, uh, Director of Place, Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council. You're both very welcome uh, to the committee this morning. Uh, we're certainly excited to hear what you have to offer and the difficulties that you've uh, experienced. I know it may have touch on some of the points that we have, um, have raised already. Obviously, the committee's main interest today in relation to its strategic planning day is the lack of rail connectivity uh, towards the west of the, the province, but also uh, we are fully aware and, and keen to hear the wider infrastructure difficulties that this region has, has experienced uh, and those projects and, and the impact that they're having on this particular council area. So without further ado, could I hand over to uh, Mr Roger Wilson, please, to, to brief the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and a, a warm welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, I'll maybe not start by asking uh, whether everybody enjoyed their, their journey uh, to Armagh <laughs> this morning, but uh, maybe we can pick that up during the course of uh, the, the briefing. Excellent journey, Chair. <laughs> Uh, as you've said, Chair, I'm joined by uh, colleagues Olga Murta, who's Strategic Director with the Council, and Sam Dalzell, and absolutely delighted that you're joining us uh, this morning. As a regional city, we want you to experience the challenges on connectivity and access that are impacting on our development, and I'm sure that you're all aware that Armagh is Ireland's oldest city. It is the ecclesiastical capital of Ireland, and it is the city of saints and scholars. Part of the discussion today will focus on the Portadown to Armagh railway line, and you will hear shortly from Powers in relation to the reopening of that line. DFI has provided funding towards a technical study into the reopening of this, and this is a, a study that is very much supported uh, by the Council. By way of context, our borough has a population of 210,000 210, residents across 76,000 households. It is the largest council after Belfast. Perhaps not everybody realises that. And as a council, we are overseeing a capital investment plan of 150 million. And the image you see uh, shows the recently opened 40 million pound South Lake Leisure Centre in Craigavon, which has the largest gym in Ireland, a thousand square metres. But it's not just a leisure centre; it is a regeneration project and a catalyst for further investment. Our annual operating budget is circa 90 million and we have 8,000-plus VAT-registered businesses located across the borough, 
we contribute 4 million GVA to the Northern Ireland economy, almost 10% of Northern Ireland's GVA, and this significant economic contribution needs recognition uh, by the government. We have a range of key sectors, <coughs> including agri-food, which we have successfully developed into the Food Heartland brand and where we have led, other areas have followed. Agriculture is worth £376 million to the borough's economy. 58% of Northern Ireland's horticulture is located in the borough, amounting to approximately £100 million per annum. Health and life sciences is an important area, including global businesses such as Almac, who announced 1,800 jobs recently, and research at Craigavon Area Hospital and the many companies that are supply chains uh, to those. The visitor economy supports the developing tourism and hospitality industry. Armagh, as a Georgian city with its two iconic cathedrals, built heritage and surrounding orchard visitor experience is a key part of our cultural tourism offer. We also have advanced manufacturing as uh, one of our main sectors. And we are, and I was interested to hear uh, the points about logistics, the borough is home to 17% of Northern Ireland's transport and logistic firms and employs almost 3,000 people. This is a sector that does not receive acknowledgement for the important supply chain process and the movement of goods. Last week's announcement on the opening of the Linen Mills Studios Game of Thrones visitor attraction in February next year will be a major boost to attract national and international visitors. This is a £40 million private investment. <coughs> Pre-COVID, the estimated visitor numbers were circa 500 to 600,000 per annum. This will put Bambridge and the area on an international map. Our Carn and Seago industrial estates are home to some of Northern Ireland's leading companies who have chosen this area because of its location. Whether that's Moy Park, Thompson Aero Seating, Wilson's, AJ Parr, Irwin's Bakery, Heister Yale, there are a diverse range of sectors located here. The two parks alone contribute £2.7 billion to Northern Ireland's GVA, and to ensure its future development, significant infrastructure investment is required. We are also working with Fermanagh and Oma and Mid Ulster District Council on our Mid South West Growth Deal. Our area accounts for one fifth of the Northern Ireland economy and contributes £7.7 .7 billion to the GVA of Northern Ireland. 27% of Northern Ireland's exports come from this area. That in itself is greater than Belfast. So the movement of goods and services around are critical. So what of our potential? Well, from the ancient, historical and beautiful cathedral city of Armagh to the wider borough which incorporates the thriving areas of Bambridge, which is famous for its rich linen-making past, Craigavon, a new, exciting and modern location, already named as one of the most desirable places to live in the UK. From the ancient fort at Navan, almost 7,500 years of history are steeped in our borough. The traditional market towns of Portadown and Lurgan and smaller towns and villages make up this mix of urban and rural landscape. So the context we are operating in, Chair, a longer term strategic approach is required for integrated infrastructure transport planning linked to sustainable development. The importance of the Green Agenda and our commitments to net carbon zero need a coordinated and focused approach led by government, the public sector, businesses and community. The RDS has a time frame of 2035, however plans including the PFG and the transport operating plans are short term and there is no integrated joined up approach which addresses infrastructure provision over a longer term. Our plans including the PFG and the investment strategy are in draft and therefore the next assembly mandate needs to prioritise infrastructure projects. Infrastructure is a key enabler to economic growth and priority needs to be given to those areas. As I've said earlier, this region makes things. We're not about the knowledge economy. We are about bringing goods and materials in, moving them around and getting them to market, getting them to ports and airports. So access to ports, airports and arterial routes needs enabling infrastructure from this part of the world. There is an opportunity to highlight connectivity as part of the Union Connectivity Review and the All Island Strategic Rail Review, and I'll expand on this shortly. Our regional imbalance, the stark image that you see on screen, clearly shows the lack of rail and road connection into our borough and the wider mid-south-west region. 
while many areas talk about a lack of investment and a lack of infrastructure, I think a picture paints a thousand words. The infrastructure deficit includes limited main arterial routes, lack of A road connectivity, for example, between Banbridge and Armagh, long journey time impacts on trade, access to labour markets, business productivity and competitiveness. In order to address the economic growth and competitiveness and to embed new ways of working, the enabling infrastructure is critical for the future development of our borough and the Mid-South West. So, for example, addressing the productivity gap to fall in line with the Northern Ireland average would see our productivity increase by 22% and that would increase the Mid-South West GVA by £1.7 billion per annum. As a border council area, we are competing with the Republic of Ireland and there have been significant road upgrades into the West, providing access to our neighbouring border towns. Therefore, we are not competing with incentives offered in the Republic of Ireland. We welcome the publication of the consultation paper on the All Island Strategic Rail Review, and we will be submitting our response. There is significant untapped potential for rail to contribute towards social, economic, and sustainable development. And we are keen to pursue the opportunities that exist for the reopening of the rail network from Portadown to Armagh and to reconnect the city to the borough and the wider uh, network. It's important uh, that improvements to the Dublin and Belfast rail connection uh, are strengthened and that the important hub rule that Portadown provides on this route. Lurgan is also an important railway station and we are keen that the increased passenger numbers are supported by investment in the station and signalling and that more uh, innovative ways to move freight around is considered. So our challenge is as we continue to work and operate in a post-COVID environment, we have addressed those challenges in our recovery and growth framework. We were the first council to produce one and it was launched back in February last year. Road infrastructure may be out of vogue, but it was the single biggest obstacle that was cited in our consultation and our consultation primarily focused uh, with our business partners. Strategic planning is subject to delays at central government level in terms of major development schemes. There are a number of delays impacting on investment, one of which is the planning system overall. I could give examples and maybe uh, during questioning. However, the perceived low bar for judicial reviews in Northern Ireland, especially in relation to planning schemes, is impacting on growth and investment throughout Northern Ireland. Planning was transferred to councils in 2015 in an unfit state and has ongoing issues that need addressed. There are reviews being carried out by the NIAO and the CNAG as well as the Minister and these must lead to improvements and we must ensure that Northern Ireland and our council areas are open for business. We would ask that this committee properly scrutinises these reports to ensure that the change that's needed takes place. To achieve geographical cohesion, it's essential that connectivity must be prioritised. Greater access to regional, <coughs> national and global linkages, including road, rail, ports and airports, are essential to ensure the faster movement of goods. So what are our priorities? I've set them out on screen and you'll be glad, members, to know that I'm not going to go through them in detail. But I will pick one, the A28 Armagh East Link, adopted in 1995 and proposed in the Armagh Area Plan in 2004, which means it has been identified in a statutory plan for the last 26 years. This route would provide an alternative route to strategic traffic, as well as significantly reducing traffic times, enhancing overall economic performance and increased productivity. And you see the other uh, items there about <coughs> rail connectivity, <coughs> access to industrial land. So for us, the key strategic issues that require consideration by the committee, in our view, the RSTNTP requires scrutiny in terms of the timescales for consultation and input. It needs coordination and linked to longer term development and funding opportunities, for example, the city and growth deals. The RSTNTP regional objectives need to be supported by sub-regional priorities <coughs> and there needs to be a greater focus on economic assessments. The Infrastructure Committee and I would argue the Economy Committee need to be working closely together. Specifically for us, Armagh City is subject to high volumes of traffic which results in vehicular congestion due to the heavy commercial vehicles. There is poor environmental quality due to noise and air pollution, particularly around the Mall area, and that creates barriers to pedestrian and active travel. 
It is also impacting on health outcomes for residents, including those that live on those congested routes. Alternative solutions, including diverting traffic, need to be looked at. There are water and energy capacity issues. Uh, the Housing Executive Housing Growth Indicator requirements show uh, an additional 17,200 for the period of 2016 to 2030 for our borough. This is over double the Northern Ireland average. If I turn then, uh, Chair, to the UK City of Culture designation, and following an expression of interest submitted in July this year, our Council and the Borough is one of eight cities uh, that has been shortlisted to become the UK City of Culture 2025. This is an important opportunity for our culture-led regeneration ambitions for the city, our borough, but this is also a Northern Ireland bid. This is not just for ABC. It's important in highlighting the uniqueness of place and the natural and built heritage that exists, and infrastructure and connectivity will be critical uh, for us to address, and we've already had that feedback that moving people around for uh, this will be important. So in conclusion, Chair, our asks of the committee are that regional imbalances are addressed and recognition is given to the significance of this council area to the Northern Ireland economy in emerging strategic policy, the proposed interventions, strategies and the new transport models, that longer term strategic planning and integrated transport planning is linked to the sustainable development agenda and prioritised with strong growth. That the RSTNTP <coughs> prioritises new strategic routes that enable growth, addresses the underinvestment and combats congestion and tackling pollution. The All Island Rail Review considers the reopening of the rail network and greater route utilisation for the movement of freight and passengers. And that partnership working to deliver infrastructure priorities for the borough arising from the UK City of Culture, the RMAP Place Plan and the Local Development Plan will take place. And with that, Chair, I'll conclude and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to the committee. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, it certainly is a, an interesting overview of, of, of the problems and, and issues faced in the area, but also indeed the achievements. Uh, given its relative lack of connectivity, uh, I think it's fair to say that ABC have, have well and truly punched above their weight in that regard whenever you look at some of the companies uh, and investment that has been attracted to the area. But you are right um, in relation to the map. The map does, the, the picture paints a thousand words, uh, and when we look at that map and we see whether that's uh, motorways, primary roads, trunk roads, railways, dual carriageways, it's clear for anyone to see the huge disparity that there is, and that starts uh, from part of the ABC region and, and sort of... Um, from the west in, it, certain, it certainly shows massive gaps. So can I ask, when you're talking to outside investors, when you're talking to businesses that want to potentially locate in this area, when it looks at its skill set of its people, etc., um, how high on the agenda is the lack of <coughs> infrastructure and indeed connectivity in their decision making whenever they're choosing the, uh, where to invest? Thank you, Chair. When we did our growth deal with our partners in Fermanagh and Oma and Mid Ulster, <coughs> we built that deal from the ground up. So that it's a business led. The two top priorities for our growth deal: infrastructure is number one, skills is number two. <coughs> our businesses are homegrown, so they are not FDI companies that have come in. These are local companies that have been startups and have continued to grow and expand. So what they have done is they are set up in this area in spite of the infrastructure. But what they tell us is that if there was adequate infrastructure, it would supercharge what they are doing. They have associated themselves as being the, Sil the Silicon Valley of, for example, advanced engineering and, and that type of thing. So those are some of the, the key issues. They are located here because we are on a north-south, east-west axis. But additional improvements in infrastructure would lead to increased productivity. We are, we are lower in terms of productivity than other parts of Northern Ireland. And as I said uh, during my opening remarks, you can see the improvement. 22% improvement would lead to 1.7 billion additionally into the Northern Ireland economy. Okay. And when you look, and i was probably particularly horrified whenever you talk about the A28 Arma Eastlink, um, the length of time involved from that it was originally a conception of an, of an idea to now. Do you, do you want to just maybe talk us through 
what has been the main barrier to progress on a project like this from your experience from, from a council perspective, uh, whether it's lack of engagement, consultation, etc. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get a picture of um, what, what contributes to these long delays in delivering key infrastructure pro projects, particularly uh, west of the province. Um, I, I'm not sure, Chair, that I'm necessarily qualified to, to answer that. Uh, I mean, all I know is that there are obviously a huge number and a huge range of infrastructure projects that are needed <coughs> across the province. I think it comes down to how they are prioritised, and that is where the RST NTP mm -hmm. will obviously come in. Okay. The op the, 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 I suppose the proposition that we are advancing is that investment in this area is not about <coughs> me too. It is about investment in this area will lead to growth in the Northern Ireland economy which will allow for more money to come in to deliver uh, additional services and so on. So investment being prioritised for, for areas that can <coughs> contribute. Okay. Um, you mentioned challenges with planning, uh, and obviously that's something that this committee has considerable remit with and, and going forward will be delving into in, in some more detail. Um, obviously we have the experience of um, the devolving of, of planning to local authorities and a local capacity. What has been your experience to date with that? Uh, and indeed, also, um, you talk about some of the, the consultees, etc., and, and you know DFI's responsibility with them. How difficult has that been? Uh, and where do you see areas in which uh, we, as a committee, can can seek further improvement to, to help local authorities uh, to to basically put their case forward and progress in some of these large infrastructure projects? Sure. I mentioned during my remarks there are two reviews that will be coming forward in the not too distant future. One is from uh, the Audit Office. Uh, it's a joint one with the Audit Office and the Controller and Auditor General, and the Minister is undertaking uh, a review herself. And I think it will be interesting to see what those reviews uh, say and, and what the recommendations are. And there <coughs> undoubtedly will be improvements that local authorities will, will need to make. If I pick up a, a couple of points, you've already referred to statutory consultees, and that is a challenge for us, getting uh, responses back in time from a range of departments, not just one department. Um, so that, that is something for us. As a local authority, we have the way the legislation was written at the point of transfer. We have inherited legacy cases that are now our responsibility and have cost this council hundreds of thousands of pounds to deal with. That shouldn't, and there is uh, an unfairness there, we believe. Uh, resources at the point of transfer, we have had to significantly increase the number of planning staff that we have because it wasn't at the right level. So we are certainly in double figures in terms of the number of additional planners that we have had to bring on board. And I've referenced the JR culture, and I, I certainly believe that while people have access to justice, and that is uh, undeniable, there is a very low bar. I have one project, a significant regional project, that has been in the system for four years, and it will take three years for that project to complete if and when it gets um, through the system. Take construction inflation, that will add about 30% onto the price of that project, and it's a public sector project. Right, that's, that's certainly concerning uh, from a committee's perspective to, to hear those delays. Uh, and finally, before I hand to other members, obviously one of the primary reasons for the committee meeting today is in relation to the, the huge level of interest now and discussion that there is surrounding rail connectivity west of the province, and that begins uh, where essentially it ends, which from, from Portadown in particular to this region. Um, the conversation is, is getting to a point now it's starting to get very exciting to listen to the proposals and how perhaps that could play its part in whether it's the decarbonisation conversation, etc. I think, I think many members will say it was extremely short-sighted uh, of previous governments whenever uh, we look to the, the way in which our, our, our rail network was disbanded west of the province and, and how effectively, uh, you know, looking at the challenges we have now, the, the big difference that that could have made. So I could ask, obviously, the feasibility study, the, the, this attention has been coming now through Council. We've seen motions, etc., supported by the Council. Where are we essentially with those conversations? Uh, and indeed, uh, how important do you see rail connectivity uh, in the future for your region? Improved connectivity is an absolute requirement. 
Uh, we are obviously in a new environment uh, where sustainable transport is, is critical. The conversation around the Portadown RML line has progressed significantly over this last probably 12, 18 months. And uh, the fact that the department is co-funding a, a study is certainly to be welcomed. Our council is behind that. Um, I'm not sure whether Olga maybe wants to say something on that because she's leading on, on the review and can give the committee an update on, on where we're actually at. Yes, um, thanks Roger and uh, good morning members. Um, we're currently in a procurement process for the appointment of a consultancy company um, with experts in, in transport <coughs> modelling to undertake that piece of work for, that, for us. Um, that procurement process is due to... Um, uh, conclude at the end of this year and we'll be appointing a company at the start of um, next year as well. And then um, just in, in terms of the importance of railway, um, as Roger alluded to in his presentation, the importance of Portadown, also on the Belfast-Dublin mm -hmm. e um, economic route, and as a major halt on that route is very important as well for us, and also um, the access at Lurgan Railway Station. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. I'll now hand over to members. So I'll go first to Carol Hunter, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for being here this morning. Um, it's a delight to be here, and thank you for hosting us. Um, and also thank you for your presentation, and it's great to hear more about this area and its level of potential and the opportunities that potentially lie ahead. Um, <clears throat> I'm based in the North West, so I wholeheartedly recognise the importance of rail as a matter of connectivity, but also as a matter of its key to economic growth, as, as you've stated here today. Um, and uh, I just have a few questions, and uh, it's been great as well to also hear about the challenges today, and then we can report those back to the Department. But just on the All Island a Strategic Rail Review, um, it, obviously it's been recently announced. Will your council be feeding into that consultation and also looking at the north-south aspect with cross-border connections? Have you liaised with other councils across the border about opportunities that are lie ahead in the future? Yeah, thank you, <coughs> uh, Cara, for the question. As somebody who worked previously in uh, Coleraine Council, I know that area very well and was involved in... Uh, work around the, the Northern Corridor Railway uh, Group, so very familiar with that infrastructure. Uh, we certainly welcome this report. I think the timing of it is, is very good, mm -hmm. uh, and it is something that the Council will certainly be uh, submitting a response to. And we are currently preparing that as officers uh, for, for the members. <coughs> we are very much, given that we're a border <coughs> council, very much working on that uh, north-south uh, basis as well. Uh, for example, we are one of eight councils that are members of the Belfast-Dublin Economic Corridor, and that's not just about getting a fast train between Belfast and Dublin. In fact, it's the opposite because it's about uh, the, the, the economy that exists uh, between those areas. So no, no difficulty at all in operating on that uh, basis. That's most welcome. Um, and can I ask, just following the feasibility study, what kind of next steps will take place or, or what do you anticipate the next moves are? Okay. Um, when, we, we, when we've undertaken that piece of work, um, we'll be reporting that back into the department. We're also going to use that as part of our evidence in the RSTNTP consultation process that will go out um, early next year. And then we're more than happy to share the findings with the committee as well. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Olga. Okay, thank you, Carol. Liz Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thank you um, for your presentation. I mean, it's, it's lovely to be here, just saying it's great to get a change of scenery um, and not too far from home either. Just, I mean, you had mentioned in, in the presentation about the challenges and, and particularly around the de development of strategic planning policy. I was interested to get a wee bit more information on that and particularly, obviously, um, regarding the, the plan and advice note on, on countryside development. I know certainly we've got a lot of contact about that and concerns around it and I was wondering if that had factored into anything that, that you mentioned there in the presentation around that. I think it's timely <coughs> pardon me, Liz, that these reviews are, are going on because the function has transferred across to local government. It will now be six coming uh, seven years. And it is something that councils had lobbied for significantly <coughs> beforehand. Um, but it is now important that there is a more strategic review is, is, is taken off these. I suppose I just hope that all of the, the important points are, are covered by the, those two reports. Northern Ireland is an incredible country, um, the, the entrepreneurship that exists, and we need to be able to have an efficient uh, planning system um, that works at 
local council level, but also works at a central level. So that's why we are keen to see the outcomes of these reports. And we know that there will be challenges in there for us that we will have to tackle uh, as well. So uh, conscious of that. But the overriding message has to be about us being receptive to uh, proposals and developers that are coming through. On the, the planning advice note that came through, I think uh, all of the councils certainly responded in a similar manner, and we welcomed then the fact that there was a, a change in, in how that was going to be progressed. So uh, we're, we're back on a, a different place now with that, thankfully. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I've, I was on the Morning Down Council for seven years, so I do know what you know the, the challenges are in planning and that, so hopefully we'll be able to address some of those. Just a couple of other things. I mean, um, as well as that, one of the other challenges you mentioned was around the potential leverage for funding. I'd just be interested to hear a wee bit more about that because you did mention you did give examples of Shard Island and things like that. So just to get a wee bit more information on on how you, you know what the challenges are um, in relation to that. Probably the, the key one that uh, we are working on, however, it is a much longer term, which is the disadvantage is the city and growth deals because that is a, a ten year plus. There is no new money coming through in terms of storment budgets, as you will be aware. So, therefore, we get back to the prioritisation and uh, who who will get what and, and when. That's where we are then looking to what are the other sources of funding. And for us, there are many that are available. I don't think capital is necessarily a, a challenge at this minute in time. So, levelling up, shared island, shared prosperity, yeah. peace plus. All of those funding uh, streams are, are coming through, and we yeah. certainly are, are looking to explore those. Um, it's around the revenue costs, so it's easy to build something. It's the running of these and the sustainability of projects, and that's the challenge with growth and city deals. It's all capital money, um, so the business cases need to, to, to look at that. But as a council, we're, we're looking right across the board. So, for example, we work <coughs> with Arma Observatory and Planetarium. They are looking at how they can um, attract additional investment in, and they're working with other planetarium in Dublin and, and uh, others in the Republic as well. Yeah, and I suppose that, that actually is a good point because I know, particularly community groups and things like that, um, revenue and, and running costs are a big issue. So that is something I think that, that has we're hearing a lot of positivity around capital, and it's brilliant. And I know certainly in, in the end of constituency I cover. Um, it's you know with some really exciting stuff, and when you look at the Shard Island <coughs> unit and all of that, there's there's huge potential. But I think it is important to recognise that how we keep those things going is going to be a challenge. So thanks for that. My last point, just in relation to um, active travel, and and I've seen in the presentation as well, I mentioned with the Greenway projects and things like that that are coming through, and I know certainly at the Newry end as well. That's that's um, it's really positive. But it's just there, there was nothing, no mention around um, construction of cycle lanes, and I just w wondered. Um, obviously, through the blue, blue green infrastructure, there is um, there needs to be work between council and DFI. Do, do the council feel that there should be um, a greater role for the department in assisting councils in accessing those type of funding? For example, um, you know, establishing and improving um, active travel in infrastructure such as cycle lanes. Yeah. I think, again, we have an eclectic mix in our council area. So if we take Porter Down, there's a very strong uh, active travel and, and uh, cycle uh, network where you can move uh, across the borough. Um, it's something we are looking at uh, for other areas. We have a new leisure project uh, that we're planning for RMA and how it will integrate in terms of cycleways and, and greenways. I think, again, the challenge, uh, while we have access to capital funding and, and hard funding, Building them again is not the challenge. It's the ongoing maintenance, the upkeep, uh, the, the you know, litter, uh, all of those sorts of things. So it comes back to it's, it's the revenue costs that are, that are associated with them. So we are having positive conversations with the department on those. Um, no difficulty there. But it's about how we as a council then prioritise. Is that where we're going to put our revenue spend into when there are so many other demands? And we're obviously looking at budgets at this minute in time. Just a final point on that then, Roger, would you say that because of the challenges around revenue and maintenance, that would actually determine whether you take forward any, any projects yeah. um, in terms of you know capital spend? So if it, it, would, it would influence decision making around whether it's feasible to, yes, it's, it's okay to build them, but it's the long term planning of, of, of maintaining them that might actually influence the decision on whether we go ahead and do that, I prefer to say. It, it absolutely does. I mean, I've three or four projects that we certainly could be looking at. Mm -hmm. um, 
50% funding for them. So on the capital side, we would be looking at match funding. We could prioritise those, but it is very much then down to uh, the revenue tail. So what we are trying to look at is the whole life cost of a project. So whether we're building a leisure centre, whether it's a community facility or whether it's a greenway, what is the whole life cost? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, it's, it's helping our council to make those informed decisions. Yeah. Just with your indulgence, Chair, on that then, I'd be interested then if you had any engagement with other council areas and, and chief executives, etc., on the same, you're at maybe expressing the same issues. Is that something you're finding is right across the board? It's not a conversation I, I've had, but <coughs> probably guessing the same sort of financial position that uh, authorities are in there. Look, it's all around revenue. Okay, that's great. I thank you very much for that. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Liz. Cahill Borna. Thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm delighted to be back in the chamber again, Chair. Brings back memories. Um, Roger was there at that time. Um, I'd led so many of the members to actually could make it. I mean, for those who live not too far away, I mean, you wouldn't want to be travelling through Armagh between half seven and half nine in the morning. It's okay after that, but it's, it's, it's horrendous and we face major challenges. But Roger, just to touch on, I appreciate, thank you for your presentation. I mean, being here and hearing it and, and knowing what goes on and living in the area um, <coughs> and seeing what we have to offer, because we have a lot to offer. Now, I can only speak as, as a representative of, of the area in Armagh itself and the part of the Armagh District Council. Um, and others are well fit to speak for other parts of, of the ABC. Um, just the challenges, I mean, and I want to just dig into some of the stuff, because I was there when we transferred the workforce model down in plan, and it wasn't adequate. And it's rolled on now ne nearly six or seven years on the challenge. Just in terms of where the plan and model is now, and what you expanded a wee bit and you nearly <coughs> doubled the workforce, just, just give us a wee feel for where we're at now. And, and Liz obviously mentioned the plan, but where we're going forward in the future. Because I, I see that as one of the challenges at the minute. And then I want to get on to some of the infrastructure and some of the other stuff you mentioned. Just in terms of plan itself, where you see it for ABC. We certainly have a an extensive uh, caseload and one of the things we did, we, we carried out an early review of our planning service and, and we split it into two different functions. One, what we would call our major uh, projects and then uh, our minors so that a large employer who was looking to invest wasn't getting his application caught up in the middle of a more routine domestic uh, application. So we, we've created our own majors and minors uh, team uh, in-house. We would work very extensively with developers and try and catch them from the early stages, pre-consultation, trying to make sure that when an application is submitted that it, it will make its way through the system as best as it possibly can. Obviously, ensuring that planning policy is, I mean, that, that's paramount, that it's sacrosanct. Uh, our planning committee is, is working very well. Um, the members who are on that committee enjoy being on it. Uh, they take their role very, very seriously. Um, but there are challenges, um, you know, there, there's no doubt about it, Catherine. Just on the infrastructure, I know myself, um, just clearly for ourselves, because I know it's part of the growth date as well, and, you know, Certainly, I would back both the east and the northwest link roads because I know I know the, the challenge of you. Uh, and I'll leave most of the real questions that you, you've answered that all in terms of. But the important thing for us is is obviously the road because because we're a border council area, um, and we'll talk about rail in the next one. But we we have to get east. We have to actually move east to get to the nearest connectivity, which is on the main Dublin. Arterial route. To be honest, we can talk about going west, which is grand, and there's, there's opportunities. And I know the entrepreneurial skills that's in the area. So my question would be, in terms of realistically, see the East Link. Where, where are we in terms of the East Link? I mean, I, I think it's doable, and, and we, you know, I'm supportive of. And whatever we can do as a committee, it will, will continue to, to to ask those questions. But realistically, where are we in terms of the East Link as Chair, I'll maybe let Olga pick up on that, but I mean, the, the point I'd make at the start, for those of you who have travelled in, you will have come across the Mall. I mean, the Mall is the most congested part of the city, or one of the most congested parts. It is one of the most iconic parts of this city and Northern Ireland. And you were making the point earlier about um, the York Street interchange and, and vehicles being stuck on that and uh, the pollution <coughs> impacts. You can imagine what that's doing for Ireland's oldest city. So therefore... 
improving that from an environmental, from a health outcomes perspective is important, but all the need yes. in terms of where they're, they're at. Yes, um, Cahill, it has been on the development plan for a long period of time, and um, our council has identified that they would like to see it prioritised as one of the infrastructure projects for the growth deal, and we hope then that that would raise it up in the prioritisation for the department. Um, currently, we're aware that uh, some initial economic assessment work has carried out in, in relation to the East Link Road, um, but further work will, will, will be required and will need to be prioritised for that to take place. But you're right as well in terms of we could have one connection with the East Link Road, but then the future opportunities with the North and West Link Road as well. So we need to sort of look at it in its entirety. Um, and the cost of the East Link Road, we estimate, is about um, £25 million at this particular period of time. On, on the grand scale of things, all goes that we're dealing with budgets all the time. On the grand scale of things, over the period of time that we've waited, 40-year period, maybe 30-year period, um, it's, not, it's not a big amount of money. And the advantages of all that, the economic contribution that will make when it's done. But just two final points, because I mean the Chair's picked. Well, I just wanted to pick up, uh, obviously, the mid south West growth. And, and the responsibility from DFA and what DFA can offer. Um, the other point I want, I want you just to expand a wee bit on our skill sets, because I, I think we have a great opportunity, but we're, we're, we have to work with the colleges to increase that, but we have a good skill set here as well in what we've got to offer. And finally, I know that in New York Morning Down, in the old system, I had a memorandum of understanding with Louth County Council. I, I think we have great opportunities. Uh, I can only speak from this part of the, the constituency. Where we have from Monaghan the links. I mean, if you if you go to Monaghan as a town, Monaghan's buzzing all the time. It's, it's, mm. There's no doubt that they've something to offer. Um, I'm just maybe expand a wee bit on that and the links and the opportunities from that. Right okay. So I suppose uh, in terms of the department and growth deals, yeah. as I was saying earlier, uh, infrastructure has been identified as the number one priority for our growth deal. So we are having significant engagement with uh, departmental officials on that. And it's, it's positive engagement. Um, however, projects are large, and the likes of the, the RMR routes that we're talking about are significant number of years out, and it's about just keeping those uh, moving. Uh, so those discussions are, are, are ongoing, uh, Cahill. And in fact, I think even today the Minister uh, is in uh, Mid Ulster. She is going round meeting um, each of the three component parts to hear from the councillors and the officers. Um, what are the infrastructure issues for us on, on, the, on the growth deal, so uh, no, no problem there. Um, the, on the skills uh, agenda, you may or may not be aware, Southern Regional College had three campuses planned. It has upgraded the RMA College, um, somewhere in the region of mid-twenties to uh, 30 million. It has uh, put a new college into Bambridge, and those are state-of-the-art uh, modern facilities. Um, the one that I project that I referenced that has been stuck at the minute is the third college, um, which was to be in Craigavon, and that was subject to judicial review, and we are awaiting the outcome of that at this minute in time. So that has an impact on the skills agenda, and we have um, pupils who are attending two colleges that are 50 years old, and employers looking for modern, up-to-date uh, facilities. So. Um, that, that's the challenge that um, we have on skills, how that links to infrastructure, how that links to planning, and then I talked about the cost uh, element as well. And in terms of partnerships, um, okay. yes, we work really closely with um, our cross-border partners. We've actually um, members of ICBAN um, in terms of the, the, the cross-border regional councils. We're also members of the East Border region as well, and then recently with the Dublin-Belfast Economic Corridor. And um, as um, you know, there's, there's regular engagement with um, our neighbouring councils as well. So um, um, working in those partnerships gives us an opportunity in terms of economies of scale to look at developmental and funding opportunities so that the whole of the region can benefit from. So. No, and I appreciate it. Just, just your indulgence, yes. Chairman. I see the skill set most important because, I mean, we're all diving into academia, but we're losing out on those skills that's needed now. Plus the modern day, you know, construction is different from, you know, these things move on. So I think it's a good opportunity there. We're a good college here in RMA as well. So I would, I would encourage that and keep that going because we have great, great opportunities here. You know. 
Chair, the, the three sites for each of those in Armagh, Bambridge and, and the proposed Craigavon one all will have specialisms um, to, to service uh, particular sectors. And I think probably that goes on to the wider point regarding the engagement cross departmental and, and even from a committee perspective. Uh, they're certainly not, not separate and shouldn't be, shouldn't be looked as such. Thank you, Cahill. I'll now go to Roy Beggs for a question. Again, thank you for, for the welcome here to Armagh. It's, it's been useful to hear of uh, your own issues in this area and the infrastructural difficulties, as, as you've highlighted here. Uh, you've focused on the A28, the Armagh East link, and I have to say I'm shocked to learn that it's been in the planning system since 2006. Um, where is it currently? Has it got planning permission? Or are you still working your way through that? Or is that... Where, where is it? Yes, um, very... Um it, there have been a number of challenges um, in, in relation to that particular route as well. There's been different routes looked at, um, and we can bring back further detail from the department as to the current status. Um, but around it, a lot more residential development has happened on the Newry to Armagh Road as well, and that's also has impacted um, on, on the route. So, but it hasn't progressed in terms of a priority for the department. Has it taken that long that it, the, the route needs to be rethought? Well, we're, we, we are very conscious you know, that there are limitations, and perhaps now with the, the residential development that is happening, um, it could very well be the department does have to look at the route, but there is a preferred route in place. Uh, again, just to give me a picture, what sort of numbers of vehicles per day are expected <coughs> to use the route? We do, we do not have that okay. detail close okay. to hand. We've asked for, for modelling um, data in relation to ARMA, but <coughs> um, that wasn't available. I'm just conscious in, in terms of my own constituency, um, the A2 uh, needed to upgrade it and I think it was either 29 or 38,000 vehicles a day before we, we managed to get it upgraded. Um, um, but certainly I can see, uh, having visited Armagh numbers of times this year, there has been congestion on each occasion. Um, I take it that congestion is actually restricting what you can do in terms of cycleways and, and uh, new active travel arrangements? It is, yes, um, it is because um, vehicular traffic is congesting right in, in the heart of the, of the city centre. And um, as we referred to earlier, we are working on an active travel master plan for the borough as well. Um, the, the city of Armagh does lend itself to more uh, pedestrian and also cycle routes, but that inf infrastructure needs to be put in in a more cohesive and coordinated way rather than a fragmented approach that currently exists. Uh, again, then, you, you've, you mentioned the Mid-South-West, um, um, I guess, the city deal bid, um, and that you're even prepared to put some of your, your, your own monies behind it. To You, you recognise it's that important. I, th I think it's a good measure of any proposal if people are prepared to commit to it th themselves. Has the department indicated if you can get so much leverage that they will then fall in behind it? Have they recognised that that would be something that they would uh, recognise and prioritise? Uh, no. If I look at the Mid-South-West, again, the infrastructure, probably we're, we're talking about the Armagh uh, road stuff at the, at the minute. There was an announcement recently about the Enniskillen Bypass. So that is further down the road, pardon the pun. Um, Cookstown Bypass and Dungannon Bypass, significantly further ahead. And I think this is our the case we are trying to make, is that when the RSTNTP comes out, what's the criteria for assessing those? Is it simply about accessing between two places? Or is it looking at what is the actual impact that building a new road will have, whether that's social impact, better access to hospital facilities, sustainable impact or economic impact. So our argument will be, and we will be looking to see this whenever it comes through, how will schemes be prioritised? How can we get the ARMA schemes almost further up uh, and, and accelerated? I understand going forward, uh, one of the negatives may well be the new independent infrastructure commission. So is that something that you are thinking about engaging with so that the importance of this to your local economy will be fully recognised rather than the executive uh, perhaps prioritising its political uh, uh, priorities? Yeah, um, our, our Mid-South West uh, politicians, we have a governance group made up from each of the, the three councils, have engaged with the minister significantly. 
And uh, the position that the Mid South West Group have is that they support uh, the Infrastructure Commissioner. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Roy. And now to Andrew Muir, please. Cheers, thank you, Chair. Thanks for coming along. Um, just three things. The first one is about logistics, and you made reference uh, in terms of the strength of that uh, business within your locality. Uh, one of the key issues is about getting people into the industry, and I was really interested to know what you've been doing to assist them in relation to that. I know Belfast have doing some stuff. Sure. Yes, um, yes. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with yeah. um, the logistics and, and uh, distribution businesses within our particular locality, and as Roger alluded to, we've almost 300 businesses based in our borough alone. We have uh, brought on board uh, specific training programmes for the sector, and we're also uh, going to be running HTV driver training programmes as well, so it'll be funded programmes to encourage um, more people to take employment in that sector. And then we've got specific business mentoring and support for businesses working in that as well. Who's paying for that? Is it yourselves or is it? Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because it's an important sector yeah, to yes. us, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's actually a sector that we have only recently identified the, the significance and the importance of, so now yes. we're, we're really getting behind it. Yeah, I think that's really important for yourself to step forward and yeah. do that. The other one's really around planning. So you've touched on the whole issue of judicial review. Um, whether there be an appetite for reform in relation to that, time will tell. There's an audit office report due out in relation to that. So audit office report, as you know, due out in relation to planning, which the Public Accounts Committee will consider um, in early new year. Um, also, there's a review of the 2011 Planning Act. Okay. So um, it's been touched upon the chair just in terms of statutory consultees is one of the issues, but we can interest to know beyond the district review and statutory consultees and the resourcing issues, is there anything in particular that you feel that we should be pushing at in terms of the department to take action on? Because I know planning is one of the key functions of councils now. Um, probably it's having a more integrated approach you know, from the strategic planning process, from the regional development strategy, to each of the councils undertaking their local development plans as well. And then um, probably the incoming planning portal, the importance of um, resourcing for that system to work effectively. And then, um, Andrew, if I could just um, go back to the point on the transport and logistics sector yes. and what Roger alluded to in the presentation. As a sector, it doesn't traditionally get any support from no. central government. And I think that's why it's so vital for us to step in and help it at this particular period of time. How's the local, sorry. So I was just going to pick up on the yes. planning uh, yeah. point, Andrew, as well. If you're a developer, yes. you will find that uh, there are different approaches across the 11 yes. different council areas. So how that can be uh, made more consistent, um, yes. I think, is, is something that needs to be looked at as well. In terms of local development plan process, whereabouts is that at the moment? We've, we've published our preferred options paper, um, a copy, you can see the, an image of it there, and we're, we're currently working um, on our workshops at the moment, and we hope to have our first um, announcement out by this, um, in the mid of 2022. Okay. Uh, the last one is the City of Culture. Yes. Where about is that? So that's something we're very excited about. Uh, we went from uh, 20 uh, applications down to eight. That was announced uh, about four to five weeks ago. The next stage is uh, there will be a, a short list from eight down to three. We have to have our bid in by the end of January, first week in February. That will be assessed, and the short list of three will be announced very shortly after that. Final decision will be made by May, so the judges will visit the three regions um, before May, and will make a final decision by May. Okay. What support have you got from central government towards your bid? Uh, central government uh, are engaging now um, across uh, the, the various departments, and I have to say I've been very, very um, pleased at. at how civic society has responded, not just within ABC, so um, business community, community groups, arts and culture groups, say within ABC, but also on, on the wider. And I, I certainly feel confident that we've got a strong offering. And for anybody who's here today, I, I think that the place speaks Absolutely. for itself. Absolutely. <laughs> Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Look, the committee have asked a series of questions, and we thank you for your presentation this morning. One thing that wasn't touched on, but yet the committee is very acutely aware of, and we heard representation in this regard regarding budgets uh, last week, obviously investment in utilities, and you've mentioned that as one of your key challenges and priorities going forward. 
Uh, how difficult are you finding that as, as a local authority, particularly surrounding the sewage and water systems capacities, and, and we know the difficulties uh, surrounding the NI water at present? Just uh, as a, a snapshot, if possible, uh, would help with the committee. Yes, um, Northern Ireland Water have recently uh, published their, their plans in relation to that, and what we're finding as well in terms of our forecasted housing growth. Um, you know, there, there will be challenges around water and utility provision, um, but also energy provision as well. Mm. That's another issue that's highlighted to us in terms of the, the cost of connecting to energy infrastructure. So it's the underground enabling infrastructure projects that are critical for us to be prioritised in the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can we, as a committee, thank you first and foremost for, for allowing us to come down to, to, to meet here today. Uh, certainly, it has been as someone that sat in this chamber in a different capacity, it's good to be here in this capacity. And can we wish you well for your City of Culture bid? Uh, certainly, that's something that we, uh, as a Northern Ireland PLC, if we're successful, uh, we were certainly very proud of. So, uh, thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Thank you all. Nice to see you. Thank you. I just could have suggest right back because I never brought up the likes of broadband. See if there's any other challenges that the council maybe. maybe yeah, we can just certainly certainly look at that. You will see uh, that was contained within the report uh, some of our asks of, of the committee, and I think what we could do by looking at that, we can maybe formulate a few questions that we can certainly uh, put into the, the system, particularly. I think it was Roy said about the, the length of time with regards that our man uh, um, is certainly something that we could we could follow up on. So we'll formulate a few questions on that uh, and put them into the system if members are agreeable. Oh. Members agreed on that point. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, members, we will now move on to our next briefing, uh, which is a briefing from the Portadown Armagh Railway Society, uh, reinstatement of the, the railway line between Portadown and Armagh. And could I welcome to the table uh, Mr. Derek Smith, committee member, Portadown Armagh Railway Society, and Mr. William Parr, uh, committee member, Portadown Armagh Railway uh, Society. I'm not seeing Derek at the table. It's really cold. <laughs> Sorry. It's yeah. cold in this room. I think that's COVID. I, know, just I expected a warm welcome, pal. We want to keep you fresh, folks. We want to keep you focused. You know, when you're focused, that's it's working. Absolutely. John, we're very sorry. I mean, I can see you here. Good. Well, you just, there's a wee bit of red diesel out there. We have to No Okay. Um, so we have the presentation on screen. Um, can I hand over? Uh, to William R. Dirk, who's going to lead off on this for us. Um, let, me just, let me just get the technology on. And if you want to point the mic towards your, your yourself, yeah. So we point the mic. Yeah, my name is uh, my name is Derek Smith, and along with my colleague here, uh, Billy Parr, we're representing the Portadown Armagh Railway Society, and. Uh, our whole committee uh, would like to express our thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today, to tell you a little bit about what we're doing, and at the risk of repeating some of what Roger has already said, uh, we'll take you through the vision that we try to present uh, and mobilise our uh, citizens in Armagh and surrounding area for what our vision is. <clears throat> We've been active as a society for over 10 years. We've become a registered charity. And uh, what I'd like to do is take you through uh, the flow of my presentation here, talk about our near-term objectives. So we, have, we have a fairly large constitution as a charity, but we've picked out two things that we're really keen to do in the near-term future. Give you a little history of the rail in Armagh, because we think it's important uh, to draw some parallels between how Armagh was viewed in the past and how we see it in the future. Talk a little bit about the original path of the railway and what kind of state is it in. And then cover a few of the topics as to why we think it's important Armagh should be back on the railway system. We'll hopefully have some time for questions. I know time is moving on swiftly here. So we kind of think of our near-term objective as to being a lobby group. We want to really press for the extension of that east-west economic corridor that we see today, which is Belfast, Lisburn, Lurgan, Portadown, 
connected by rail, and we want to see it extended to include Armagh City, and, and in so doing, make us part of that economic corridor. <clears throat> the majority of traffic on the railway system across the east-west here is not between Belfast and Dublin. The majority of it shuttles between Portadown and Belfast. The second thing is, we know you don't just decide to build a railway, so we need to get ourselves into the <coughs> various strategies and planning documents, and, and uh, Roger talked about the RST, NTP, whatever it is, <coughs> the Regional Strategic Network Transport Plan, and to be part of the All-Island Rail Review, because we want to be very much part of that. We have looked at uh, comparable projects across GB. Uh, if we look at the Borders Railway project and various others, we, we would put our finger in the air and say 20 million a mile it takes to bring a railway back to life that was there before. So 10 miles, 200 million, we're saying it's not an outrageous project in terms of infrastructure for Northern Ireland. It's comparable with any of the major road widening schemes and dual schemes that we've had here in the past. So we're not talking billions and billions of pounds. It's a, a, about a $200 million project, $2 million. Pounds. So just a little bit of the history. I'm not dwell too long on this here because you're probably uh, familiar with a lot of it. If you've been watching TV lately, you've seen a lot of the history on some of those programmes. But the first railway project in this part of the world ever was back in 1836 when an Act of Parliament approved uh, uh, the construction of a railway between the city of Armagh and the town of Belfast. And the reason this was necessary was Belfast was becoming a lively place, it was becoming a centre of commerce, the port was important, but it needed the supplies of people and goods and materials from the centre of the province where it existed, and that was in Armagh. And to that first railway, it reached Armagh in 1848, and it was completed then. There was a little hiccup getting over the ban and pulled it down, but it eventually got there. And it didn't stop there either, because by 1858 it was in Monaghan, and then it went on to Clonus, where it joined up with the railway there and made Inniskillen accessible. So it represented a, a, the building of the first kind of east-west corridor that existed at that time. And then there was about uh, 100 years of operation, but just over 90 years of operation, where goods and, and people made that uh, movement across the, the country, fueling Belfast growth with both talent and materials and goods. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, the act of closure as uh, iterated in the Benson report, uh, had this paragraph 43, and it said, it will suffice to say at this stage, now this is 1963, that the road congestion in Belfast is already serious, and it must become worse as more and more cars are brought into use. Well, how prophetic was that? It follows that some alternative form of transport other than private cars in and out of Belfast will, in my view, inevitably be needed in the future. So, and here we are, we say. If you've been watching television recently, you may have seen the Channel 5 programme. Bob Bell has been walking disused railways. And along the way, he visited Armagh and he talked about it. He walked part of the line. And uh, it was clear, it became clear to him that Armagh was actually a major rail hub in the past because you couldn't just go from Armagh to Belfast, you could go through Market Hill and down to Warren Point, you could go to Cady, you could go to Monaghan. This was quite an active uh, distribution centre, as it were, for travel of goods and people uh, through the province. And he made a, a poignant visit to our little memorial on the Mall uh, to recognise the Armagh Railway disaster, and he thought it was ironic that the city that had created the safety systems for rail today actually doesn't have a railway. The railway disaster brought about fundamental changes in rail safety, and uh, it, uh, yet we're not connected to the network anymore. 
It's just a little bit of the history. So Armagh was very important. It was on the rail system before. And although despite uh, a lot of representation at the time, the decision was still taken that Armagh shouldn't be included in the future rail network. As far as the railway itself goes, you know, they say the Great Wall of China is visible from outer space. I'm not sure if that's actually true or not, but here's the original railway path visible in satellite view between Portadown and Armagh, with Portadown on the right, with the P and Armagh down in the bottom left of that little picture. You can see the A3 wiggle its way across between the two, but the smooth curvature of the railway line, the old railway line between Portadown and Armagh, is clearly visible. The good news is there are no housing developments built on it. There's no commercial business centres or business parks built on it. There are no recreation facilities built across it. It is largely across open countryside. Yes, farmers have commandeered bits of it and built a shed or two along the way, and we've walked the line and had a look at that. But in terms of the availability of that route to be reinstated, it is absolutely surprising. Bob Bell, when he was over and walked part of it with us, said it was like a penalty kick with no goalkeeper. It was such a glaringly obvious opportunity. <clears throat> and we would agree with him. So let's talk about why we want to see it done. Now, Roger has talked a lot about the attractions, and, and some of you here in the room have talked about how important uh, uh, tourism and so on is for Armagh. Bar the great Barry McGuigan once said that to win a fight in Italy, you had to knock your opponent out twice to get a draw. We have two th cathedrals in this city. And that's a phenomenal thing, both uh, in the name of St. Patrick, a Protestant one, and some say the proper one, or vice versa. The planetarium and observatory are there, the Trinity Museum. The, the list goes on and on. This is a phenomenally cultural city that people should be uh, really keen to come and see. And we think the tourism opportunity is grossly underdeveloped. One of the big hazards is it's not that easy to get to, and when the cruise ships were coming into Belfast, people were reluctant to only go as far as Portadown and then make a transport mode shift to try to get on to Armagh. Culture tourism is a big thing these days. Faith tourism is a big thing these days. And we think Armagh is perfectly poised if we could just have that nice, efficient corridor for getting people right into the town, into the city. The second reason for doing this is the environmental crisis, the climate crisis that we hear about day in, day out on television. We think restoring the rail link here would be a significant demonstration of a climate aware, climate action to do something about it. Domestic rail, or rail as we know it, is just about the least carbon producing form of transport that you can get these days. This is government information <clears throat> and shows what it's like. In Northern Ireland, the average car occupancy is 1.2. If you've been in the traffic across the A3 in the mornings, you'll see it's per closer to 1 for sure. And that's a problem all around. The A3 currently handles, well, currently handles, in the last survey, which was 2016, was 16,500 car journeys per day on seven-day average. That's close to 5 million car journeys a year. Even a 20% shift, modal shift of transport off private cars onto rail would be a million car journeys a year taken off the road. And then you're starting to, to see a real impact on uh, environment and making a, making a difference. It's a massive benefit for tourism. It's good for the environment. We think we're looking at something that really makes sense. But there's a little bit more... And Roger showed a map not unlike this one here. The real closure program in the late 50s and early 60s created this big gap in the north of the island, northwest of the island. One of the things it did was it reduced the incentive for people to live near the town and to live near the transport nodes. Bob Bell himself, uh, when he was visiting, remarked that there was a time here 
when nobody lived more than 15 miles away from a station. And that's because it drove the, the building of communities and the arrival of, of services, into, particularly into Belfast. With the loss of that incentive to live near the town, now what happens? We live all over the place. Personal cars have resulted in a complete uh, dissemination of people right across the province. If you ignore the Sperrins and the Mourns and the Glens of Antrim, there's hardly a kilometre square of ground in this province that doesn't have a house on it. And I'm sure you've seen that as you've driven around the country yourself. So we say it's never too late to start to reverse the trend. Let's get the notion of mass transit, of public transport, back on the agenda. Let's get the railway system expanding again and drawing people back to live closer to where the transport nodes are. The biggest help you can give a family is to prevent them needing a second car. And so many of our families all have two cars because one's involved in getting to and from work each day. We think Armagh is not just a case of put a little connector into Armagh. It would be the first step in perhaps re-establishing one of those east-west connectors that existed before. There's no reason why this can't be the first step to Monaghan and on to Clonus and on to Enniskillen. And who knows what might be possible. Enniskillen, Oma, Derry, Oma, Arma, Oma, Dungannon, Arma, Oma, Dungannon, Portadown, and start to create that network of connectivity because the network would have multiple access routes and multiple nodes. So we think... Arma makes sense. It should be on any future planning that's being done, and we want to be in there with our uh, view of that. Suspend the meeting. So I'll hand it back over to Dirk Smith. Thank you. So just to, to wrap the whole thing up, this is a little framework that we have been using on some of our flyers and with our members to um, encourage the community to get engaged with us and to grow the support for us. First of all, you know, Rail travel promotes equality and social integration. The advantage of rail is that everybody walks through the same railway station. You meet people on the train, you sit across from people, from, and it, it encourages uh, that kind of uh, in integration. The transport nodes themselves, the station is a place where everybody walks through, which can have some mixed commercial and residential uh, accommodation, and it draws people from all over the city. It improves health and well-being. We've talked about active travel. If you travel on the train, you do have to get a little legwork in getting in there. It reduces uh, pollution-related illnesses through lower pollution effects. And it's a less stressful way of travelling. I mean, compared with sitting in your car when you hit the traffic at Lisburn and the uh, agony of getting into Belfast, wherever it is you're going, uh, rail travel is very leisurely, and you can even do some work uh, and relax on the train. And there's less people on the road, so lower accident exposure as well. It's a means of taking <coughs> climate action. It means we're actually doing something that's going to help us deal with the climate emergency. It won't be the answer to everything, but it's a step in the right direction there. And it helps our economy prosper. And we talked about tourism, but it makes mm -hmm. Armagh a better place, an even better place to live because you can commute uh, if you want into Belfast or somewhere in between to do your work. Armagh can become more of a shopping destination and it can be a place to attract and uh, put new businesses. So it's the notion of extending that corridor. Okay. Okay, can I thank you, Dirk, for your presentation? Very comprehensive presentation, may I add? Um, certainly for those that aren't familiar with the history of Armagh and particularly the significance of, of rail, uh, it certainly is very, very interesting. I can say that I don't live too far away from the old line. I have walked part of it. Um, and I suppose probably even in its sense, I always find that sometimes disused railway lines have not been utilised in general in the way in which they should have, uh, particularly to the west of the province. Part of that old railway line did actually connect so rural communities right across the west of the province, which essentially 
with the decimation of, of the railway line actually made those communities more fragmented uh, throughout history. I, I think that the quote <laughs> that you mentioned from, and I'm just getting it here, from the Benson Report mm -hmm. is particularly interesting to talk about foresight in 1963. <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, it, it, it feeds in very much to where the conversations are today. And I have absolutely no doubt uh, that rail has a part to play, um, part to play in relation to connectivity uh, alongside other infrastructure projects. So can I ask, and I have, as I've said, been on part of the old disused line. Uh, not familiar with it as we get closer into Armagh City. Um, what are the main challenges to the reinstatement of that line? For example, where exactly was the old halt in Armagh? Uh, and has that essentially been built on or built over, uh, which, it, which would make it more difficult as we come towards the, the destination of Armagh? Yeah, the, the original Armagh railway station, which was actually a, a beautiful building, and you definitely would not get demolished in it today. It seems to put it down, actually. It was built, uh, yeah, after uh, uh, the same architect and Monaghan station as well. The three stations were designed by the same architect. It was where the bus, basically where the bus station is today, and the gates of the original railway station are the gate pillars and are, are there, uh, which is the entrance to the bus station. Of all the types of uh, buildings that are in there now, some of them still show the characteristic shape of their original railway use. Uh, most of the businesses there are not necessarily city centre type businesses and could easily be out, relocated out of town. And uh, actually, one of the people who are most supportive of our campaign were Armatile, who are right there where the trains would have arrived in and where the station would have been. And they were very enthusiastic that the site would be uh, reassigned to rail use. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> some of our, our colleagues that we work with uh, uh, in TransLink have been with us and look, taken a look at the access way in. And uh, they have said that there's really nothing there that would be a major obstacle at all to bring in the train right back into the original footprint of the original station. Okay, and in relation to costs, so you mentioned 20 million a mile. Um, how realistic are those costs, uh, and how, what process have you went through to cost out the project? Well, we've, we've, we've used a calibration from other similar projects. Uh, the Borders Railway project in Scotland was about 16 million a mile despite it having over 30 railway stations, <clears throat> sorry, 17 railway stations and it's 32 miles. Uh, there's a number of others in the south of England which were in the 18 to 20 million pounds a mile range. And that's, I say, that's a thumb in the air estimate. So we would regard that as a fairly reasonable uh, estimate. Okay, and what has the engagement been like from the likes of DFI in relation to the project? Well, I think we've transitioned from being an irritant to being, uh, yeah, having some good points and some good uh, vision to help them. And uh, it has now come around whereby I think more and more people are getting used to the idea that, yes, actually uh, an increased rail network here in this part of the world will almost certainly be part of a future solution for transport. And even an interest in... Uh, thinking about freight again. Uh, I don't know how many of you have travelled on the roads today. Uh, the number and, of large HG vehicles is uh, part of the congestion issue that we have. Uh, hauliers seem to now want to buy bigger and bigger and bigger machinery. And those lorries are travelling through our small towns and villages and up and down the motorway. Uh, there ha with a proper rail network, there has to be another solution for that. Okay, and, and finally from me, in relation to the consultation, how warm has this proposal been received by landowners, particularly farmers, on the line? Well, for those of that we've, we've talked to, and we, we deliberately haven't gone and stirred the hornet's nest, uh, uh, we have found it being very positive. People would seem to be of a view that the railway should never have been closed in the first place and uh, would be very positively disposed towards having it reinstated. Now, uh, obviously, uh, all of these things, whether you're why, creating the A4 between the end of the M1 and Balagoli roundabout, there's roads that will have to be 
uh, revised and lanes, uh, farmer access will have to be thought about again, uh, be all of that. But that's all part and parcel of those uh, calibration estimates that we've made. Okay, Th thank you. I'll now hand over to members. Can we go to Liz Kimmins first, please? Thanks, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. It's very, very interesting, even just to see the history. Um, and I think it's, it's quite timely when you look at where we're at in terms of climate change and all of that, and, and COP26. And um, it's certainly what's on everybody's lips, I think, at the minute, how we can transform um, travel. Just, I mean, in terms of the, the rail review and the regional transport network plan, are they to... Um, initiatives that you will be feeding them to? Well, we absolutely want to be part of those. Yeah. Uh, and the previous transport strategy review transport plan, uh, we were a one-liner in that, okay. that uh, reopening the line to Armagh would be looked at. We'd like it to be a much stronger entry in the next uh, publication of that transport plan, which is why we've been working with the Council on the Railway Working Group. Uh, Billy and myself are both represented on there, and we're driving hard to make sure that, first of all, the scoping study that was done feeds forward into this technical study that's underway at the moment. And uh, we think the further along that path we get, the more likely we are to have it as a proper entry in the, uh, in the strategy, next strategy document. Yeah, and I think when people realise just the all-encompassing benefits of it, you know, it's not just simply getting from one destination That's to correct. another, there's so much more to it. Yeah. And I suppose just on that, I mean, we've obviously talked a lot about, you know, the, how it will benefit um, climate action and, and making, I suppose, our transport network more sustainable, mm -hmm. which I think is, is really important. Um, it does have a big role to play moving forward, and I note that this year was marked year of the rail Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. by the EU. So, I mean, this is a project that you have championed for, for quite some time, as you've explained, and I know that in 2015, Scotland had extended a previously closed rail track um, from Edinburgh to Tweed Bank mm -hmm. um, at the Scottish border with great success. So, um, and a study showed, just like what you've said there, that communities were benefiting along the length of the route because um, it provided job and investment opportunities. And I think that's very similar to what we're talking about here. So it is um, undoubtedly bringing positive impact right across the board. So just to hear your thoughts, I mean, any other success stories like that that you're aware of that we could draw on um, to try and increase support for, for reopening? Well, um, well, the main reopening. inspiration for us has been that uh, Edinburgh Street Bank mm -hmm. extension. The benefits that were predicted from that in 10 years were achieved in a year and a half. Uh, it was it far exceeded the expectations of anyone. It's a classic case of build it and they will come. Uh, and we know that's the case because we know when you build new roads and widen roads, more traffic comes. So uh, we'd rather reverse that trend and not provide for more cars, but provide for not using your car at all. Um, the... The leader of that campaign, the uh, Border Railways campaign, was due to come to our AGM. He has been over and, and, and looked at our situation and was very happy to come. Unfortunately, that was cancelled due to the COVID outbreak, but uh, we've worked very closely with them. That's been our main source of inspiration from of comparable projects. Okay, that's, great. that's all my questions. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Liz. Just, Captain Captain just, on a, just on the side, this little picture in the background there, uh, the lady on the left is uh, Susan McComb. She uh, uh, organised a petition uh, in Armagh City to have the railway uh, restored, and she thought she might get you know a thousand, maybe two thousand signatures. She's seen here handing a ten thousand signature petition to Dominic uh, Bradley. Dominic Bradley was the MLA at the time, and Mela Campbell, who was from ABC Council, and that was in 2014. So we talked about things being in the system a long time. Uh, there was a prediction uh, from the then minister, Danny Kennedy, that uh, he could see work starting in five years, uh, which 2019 has been and gone. Very brave. <laughs> been and gone, but uh, we're ever hopeful, and okay. uh, we keep at it. Okay, uh, Cahill Boylan, please. Thank you, Chair, and thanks very much, and William Officer and Derek have talked before. Um, I, would, I would like to say it back. I mean, the more, the more I see in the presentation, um, the more likely there, there's an opportunity for Absolutely. it. Mm -hmm. I'll put it that way to you. I mean, I just want to go back to the cost thing because I mean, obviously the cost issue. Because I remember even some of the debates. I remember Dominic bringing the petition in. Some of the debates around that time was seriously, obviously, it's the money issue. But mm. 
We've moved on now in terms of tackling the pollution issue, tackling climate change, car journeys, electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. All those things are moving in our favour. Mm -hmm. But realistically, you just want to get a feel for the, for the cost and stuff. Now, j just on that, but, but my main question is, obviously there's a feasibility study going on now. What, what would you like to see out of what, what do you potentially see coming out of it? Well, we're talking about feasibility study. We were told by the council that it was a technical study. So we, we were understood that to mean that the, we're going to take a look and see technically is this possible. Uh, you know, we've looked at it from a satellite view. We've walked the track. We've looked at where the bridges were in the current state of a lot of the infrastructure. We understood that that was going to bring us a, a technical possibility outcome and that the economics of it would come sometime later. But now I'm, I'm hearing feasibility study. In fact, I think Olga used the word feasibility study, which we think should be taking into account all the economic factors and benefits that would come of a reinstatement of the railway. So the, the impact on social and well, health and well-being, environment, those all need to be included because they're all critical benefits that come from it. We believe that if those were all taken into account, this would be a little bit of a no-brainer. No, no, I appreciate that but because, I mean, you know, and, and it's funny the chair asked you about, about um, uh, engaging with farm owners and everything else. You know, we, you know, I jump over here and go for a walk out over the fields and I often say, I haven't stopped to just say, the land's only lent to you. Now you may own it, <laughs> but we often say the land's only lent for your lifetime, you know. And, and I mean, looking at what you've done there and seeing, seeing that route, there's bigger challenges for, for roads. That we talked about the Eastlink Road earlier mm -hmm. on. We know I'm, I'm here in Armagh, so I know the challenges, but that's open countryside. And, and I think there's, that's why I say that there's a realistic opportunity here. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm talking about technical and feasible study, because mm -hmm. there's great benefits out of this, and yeah, economic absolutely. benefits out of it. So, so that's what, just, just my final point, because the, the, and it's interesting the Benson thing, because I actually know it myself. 1963, how they how foreseen that, and, and years later, you know, it, it, you know it's, it's nearly prophetic. But um, see, see, in terms of the, just talk a wee bit about the impact of it going and the potential benefits of it coming back, you know what I mean? Mm. You, because you, you give us a good enough presentation there. Well, one of, the, one of the things to think about is that you could be uh, from the, the station in Armagh. Just want to check here again, folks. Okay. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think so either. I don't think it's too much. No, I, I think if, if somebody could please inform uh, a member of staff here that yeah, we I just. I think there needs to be something medical. No, it doesn't. It doesn't look good. It doesn't. Look good. Okay. Do you, do you just to, to finish the point. Oh, we can see, uh, and it's perfectly reasonable to expect that you could get a, into the station in Armagh and be walking out into Great Victoria Street in under 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's a fantastic benefit to everyone. Sorry, Dirk, could I just yeah, pause the meeting, please, yes, Ben, for, for a moment? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Smith. Yeah, and we were, we were trying to explain what, what some of that benefit would look like. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, we believe is that the number of faith tours and, and cultural tourism, uh, our man misses out a lot on that. And uh, Bill himself has conducted some, albeit anecdotal, uh, interviews of, of uh, foreign visitors on the enterprise on their way back from, uh, from Dublin towards Belfast and asked them about coming to our man. And almost 100% of them said that, you know, well, if... if if they could have got there on the train, they would be there. Uh, and we think uh, our man misses out a lot on that. <clears throat> no, I, I think, just finishing, Jeremy, I, I know what I mean, because I live near, we know the huge potential that our man has. It, it is a u unique package, tourism package to offer. <laughs> it's not all about we heard in terms of entrepreneurial skills, but I mean, I really appreciate it. I definitely think there's an opportunity and mm -hmm. shouldn't be missed in terms of, but, but I will say one thing, well, I'm old enough to remember the old railway line in Katie. You know, it took a lot of years to take it down, but um, I'll tell you, I remember the older people talking about the line when it was 
Hmm. It was used, hmm. and I mean, it was great. I thought it was closed in '63, Carl. Hey. No, it was actually closed in '57. They took, they took nearly 30 years to lift the whole. Like it was still round, sure. I mean, if, if people had, had the foresight, I mean, some of the line was there in 1970, and 75, in some cases, and some believable if they had had the vision, even putting a road up it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there was great opportunity. It's unbelievable how long it still. Is. And they're still but anyway. Okay. That's, that's me. Thank you. Your Thank you. And I go to Roy Beggs for a question. Again, thanks for your presentation. It's, it's been helpful to learn that it's the line is relatively uh, free. You did say there are some issues about in, in your report that uh, um, there were some houses being built close to it, and there's some access yeah, route, yeah. routes that have developed. So um, uh, you know, there are there are some issues to be overcome. But I'm I'm just curious uh, whether there are any sizable centres of population en route to Armagh or would it just be uh, the two stops Armagh and then sorry, on the route to, to port it down to link up with the rest of the network? Well, in, the, in the past there was uh, the, what was known as Rich Hill Station which was kind of halfway between Rich Hill and Loch Gall. Those two communities kind of uh, used that as a station but we think in the interests of keeping the service efficient and the, the scoping study that was done concluded that at least uh, initially uh, there would just be the, the stop at Armagh uh, and port it down. In, in terms of any potential new service, there's two aspects. The first is, is the capital cost to, to build the railway and uh, any extra trains that are required associated with that. But then there's the running costs. So my, my question around that is, has there been surveys carried out of the number of passengers who are already using the transport, uh, maybe blinking at Porta Down, who are commuting from Armagh by car, adding to the congestion, who would uh, obviously take the train from Armagh itself, were that an option, or uh, the potential for uh, new passengers who are presently using their car to travel onwards along the, the railway line, uh, to, to, to switch to real passengers because really what you need to know is yeah. what are they expect the commuter usage uh, regular traffic the trouble with uh, tourists is it's there as part of the year mm-hmm. and then you don't have it the rest of the year um, so and in particular there are options of travelling to Portadown, Lurgan, Moira Lisburn and then Belfast ultimately so has there been any surveys carried out by either council or the mm-hmm. Uh, uh, transit or the, the infrastructure department to try and determine what the potential uh, usage of such a service would be, because that's the, that's the running cost that you have to uh, raise income well, from. We're, we're, we're not aware of any surveys that have been carried out. Uh, we've talked amongst ourselves as a society, should we be trying to do some kind of <laughs> survey, a bit like we did with the petition, uh, and we haven't uh, figured out whether we have the capability to do that or not. Uh, right now, what we've done is we've looked at comparable reopenings and looked at the, the design basis and the estimates that were made and what the reality looked like. And in almost every case, the reality far exceeded any of the estimates that were made in advance. So we, we would be hopeful that when you get down into that level of detail and those kind of numbers, that there's enough traffic on that A3 The avoidance of having to turn that into a dual carriageway would be a benefit all round and it would uh, uh, prevent this attracting more cars phenomenon that wider roads produce. We are fairly confident that the majority of commuter traffic across the A3 in the mornings isn't all on its way to the railway station. By the time you've driven to Portadown and you're almost at the M1, you go onto the M1 and you drive on to Belfast. So we're not taking a car off 10 miles of road, we're taking a car off 40 miles of road and we think the, the benefits to that are, are there to be had. In terms of enumeration, no, we haven't been able to do that yet. No, yet. I, I, but I that just, will come. I, I just suspect that you know, it's a complicated uh, yes, issue to do that and, and uh, perhaps it's, it's more something for the, mm. the, the Department of Infrastructure to That's be looking correct. at in terms of development. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Cathal, you had a quick just, supplementary. Just on that point, Chair, because I mean, I'm glad Ray raised that. As part of it, one of the committees I was on, I took a bus route from my hometown to Stormont. It took nearly three hours by the connections. Left at 10 past 7 in the morning, didn't get. If you go down to the bus station, you'd soon see who leaves from Armagh to go to Belfast. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's, that's, that's only one wee outlet. Okay. Sure. It's not just about 
the cars and everything else. There's a lot of benefits. I think a lot of people would drive in Armagh Park up and, and travel. There's, there's a lot of people leave this area. Uh, uh, sorry, I you? travel uh, very regularly on the trains from Belfast to Armagh to Portadown. <laughs> and, uh, I was going to say, did you know something we didn't? <laughs> I knew something you didn't. Uh, and I can say categorically that there are a lot of Armagh people who use those trains. I mean, I remember one day, about three or four months ago, I was sitting in a coach and I counted 13 people in that coach that I knew either lived in Armagh or lived around the Rich Hill area. And it's very significant too that uh, most of those people will drive to Portadown. They, They don't go by bus. But they, they do drive to Portadown, they park and then they go to Belfast on the train. And the other thing I think it was that uh, Derek was mentioning, you said about a stop in between the two places. You all know the Stonebridge roundabout. Well, I've heard a lot of people, especially from the Rich Hill area, say that if there was a park and ride at Stonebridge, they would use it mm-hmm. because it's very <coughs> handy to the village itself, you know. No, and I think that point, I, I know it's a very busy line um, because there has been numerous calls even for an additional halt at Craig Avon. Uh, and, and I've been on that train line, I know what it's like in the morning, uh, particularly. So it is, mm-hmm. it is quite a popular line, and, and, and indeed, the added benefit, as has been mentioned, regarding the, the last stop at Port to, to then to end Dublin also shows a, uh, there's, a, there's a great opportunity there which Armagh c- could feed into. So it's a point well made. I'll go now to, to Andrew Muir, please. Cheers. Thank you, Chair. Very briefly, because most of the questions I was going to ask already been asked, but very supportive of all the, what you're doing. And I think the documentary it was out two weeks ago when I think was mm-hmm. good to highlight this. It's just really whether you would expect to be service to run direct from Armagh to Belfast or would you it's or them for them to be terminating a port of down and for people to be changing because this is a key model just in terms of how it would operate? Uh, I know that Mr Muir would be well up on all this sort of thing but uh, it's rather interesting actually if you look at a, a service coming from Belfast to port of down yeah. it takes it approximately 34 35 minutes now, a uh, person that some of you have heard of before, probably, Dennis Grimshaw, yeah. one time calculated that they could do put it down to Armagh in 12 minutes. But we would suggest it might take 13, 14. <laughs> <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you <laughs> added that to the time that, for example, the Enterprise takes about 25 minutes from Central Station. Yeah to port it down. Yeah. Now from Great Victoria Street it would probably be slightly quicker. Yeah. But one way or another, Belfast to Armagh would take around 40 minutes uh, with the stops at yeah. Lisburn, Lurgan mm-hmm. and uh, Moira yeah. and port it down of course. Yeah. It would take somewhere around 48 minutes. Yeah. So it would be it would be a lot quicker all around. Yeah. But having said that, if you think of the 48 minutes if a train left Great Victoria Street on the hour, it would be an hour mark 48. Yeah. It is a 12-minute layover to do the return journey on the hour again yeah. and dovetail into the current Portadown service. Yeah. Back in Great Victoria Street at 48 again, 10-12-minute yeah. layover, mm-hmm. and that train can shuttle up and down. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, that's Andrew. Good. Yeah, that's good. That's... Do you, do you, sorry, anything else for the dog? No, 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 no. He sold it to me, so he has to. Okay, Carol, please. Yeah, uh, just, just. Uh, I don't really have a question. Andrew's kind of covered what I was going to ask. But more of a comment, just to, to thank you for yeah. being here today, and I think it's really refreshing um, to see your passion behind this project. You know, and as a real way society, informing us of. Um, you know all the things that need to be addressed and I think it's evident there's regional imbalance issues and we as a committee will hopefully be helpful in, in tackling that so um, thank you very much your briefing was very helpful and especially on the environmental perspective thank you okay, okay. gentlemen thank, thank you very much I, I think that was a very very informative presentation obviously as a committee this is in the, the media spotlight now in, in relation to whether we look at whatever review it is whether it's the Union Connectivity Review the, the All Ireland uh, Review whether it's even our own review uh, and indeed locally Rail is being flagged up continuously and in particular to the west of the province so while there may be issues here and, and as I say as a committee this is the first time I've probably heard in depth 
uh, some of the, the issues involved. Um, certainly, by your presence here today, it's been a powerful testimony to the committee, actually, as to uh, what, a, what potentially reopening of a line could look like and, and what benefits, material benefits, there could be. So thank you very much for, for that. Uh, and be assured, as a committee, uh, you know, this fits in very much with one of some of our strategic aims for the rest of the mandate. Uh, and if there is further questions that we can ask, uh, by all means we will, as to uh, you know, the department's interaction in relation to the feasibility study, etc. And were, um, in fact, even other council authorities. Sure, I'm sure there's a lot of other council authorities in the west of the province uh, that have had similar mm -hmm. thoughts and ideas, and maybe they're not just as practical given the... Um, given the, the, the unobstructed nature of some of the, the, the old line here. So certainly very interested, and can I thank you both for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for listening. We appreciate the opportunity to, to tell our story because we are, as you say, very passionate about this. We believe, believe strongly in it, and anything we can do to get it into that regional strategy review and get it as part of the All-Island Rail Review, we want to be in there mm. fighting our corner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you. And again, um, obviously there's been a numerous issues covered by questions, and I, I, I will defer to the clerk in perhaps maybe in a note to perhaps in the same manner that we did from the council in terms of asks, that if there is particular questions that we can put towards the department, we'll summarise and members can, can, can agree whether or not those are issues in which they would like to ask. Members agreed with that line of approach? Yeah. I think it's productive. Yeah, given if there's anything else, they, they need to send on to us. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Communicate, yeah. yeah. OK, members, thank you. We'll now move on to agenda, agenda item number eight, which is the forward work programme. The uh, agenda item will commence in public session with an indicative time of uh, 11.45, the forward work programme, as seen. Um, it's the draft work programme at page 379 of your pack. Uh, members are happy enough uh, with that forward work programme. I see we have ESB. Next week, I think that'll be a very interesting be session. Yeah. I know some have been calling for that for some time. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> I said my apologies. Uh, no, no, it's going to be a fan. Uh, no, and I think members, you know, something that's really come to my attention. Yeah. Obviously, um, ESB and the, the electric vehicle infrastructure yeah. is certainly something that's definitely of interest to the committee. But again, and it's coming time and time again, is this massive topic now surrounding hydrogen yeah. uh, and also for, for some they would say that you know the, whether it's the, the electric vehicles aspect is maybe an interim until perhaps in the future what uh, long term sustainability in relation to road transport looks like in relation to energy um, certainly that's something that I think I would like to be building in along the line when we, we're talking about different renewables and how they're going to, to impact <coughs> I think future briefings on the hydrogen agenda would be very good for the committee, in particular in relation to road transport. We had the, we had a fantastic meeting at Wright Bus where we started to see that filter out, but there's many other aspects that I don't think we have a committee has had yet a chance to explore, so it's something that we can include down the line. Uh, you'll see also on the 19th we have the ministerial briefing. Uh, if members have any other issues particularly that you'd like onto the agenda there, uh, three have been highlighted because those were three that were raised at the previous committee certainly uh, do say so and we could have hopefully a, a very good meeting there and indeed then reaching out into the 26th you'll see the briefing on the the rapid transport and indeed uh, the EV infrastructure update um, members i think probably you'll agree with me and i know we had some debate as to where we would meet except for an out meeting i think it's been absolutely fantastic to meet down here today and i think it's given members a huge um, insight into particular a particular locality and the problems that they're facing and also some innovative solutions and I, I, while it's particular interest to me given that it is my locality i think there's other council areas out there that members may have uh, an interest in some of their st regional st um I don't know about that, yeah. infrastructure I mean, issues you, when you go to the best it's going to be very hard to follow <laughs> term, so so all i'm saying members that if it is within protocol uh, and I know we have a short period of time, but end of the new year, if it is within protocol in relation to COVID regulations, uh, I am very interested as a committee to get out. I think it's, it's, a great, it's a great symbolic act as well that we're interested in listening. And no better place than a council building to facilitate 
a committee meeting because they're used to facilitating elected members, but it also then brings all of the other bodies in on it. So the council can give an overview, which covers that wider area, and then whatever topic of interest that we're covering, I think is a very efficient way of doing business. So have a thought on that, members, because it was something that I would be open to, particularly in those other areas uh, across the board. Okay, agenda item number nine is any other businesses. I have none. Uh, I think members have raised everything that they have to raise in the course of the meeting. So I'll now go to agenda item number 10, which is date, time and location of the next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 15th of December, 2021, in the Senate Chamber Parliament Buildings. Can I advise members that are interested in attending uh, that they should now make their way to the Armagh Observatory and Planetarium, in which there will be uh, a chair, but that's not mandatory for members. It's, it's, it's entirely up to yourself. If you wish to attend. And can I advise those members in the room of the need to maintain social distancing while leaving the meeting and ensure all uh, paper and glasses have been removed? Thank you very much, members. The meeting is now adjourned. Sure. 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 Now adjourned. Sure.